Luke chapter 22. Let me read from verse 24 to 38. The Lord's Supper has just been celebrated. Judas has just gone out to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. And now in verse 24, there was also a dispute among the disciples as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials. And I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, Strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. Then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny three times that you know me. And he said to them, When I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, No, nothing. Then he said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Let's pray once more. Father, will you help us today to take to heart and to reckon carefully with the things which we are reading, that our sense of spiritual reality, our sense of our place in history, our sense of our relationship to the Christ who has loved us and given himself for us might be real in our souls and evident in our lives. Lord God, have mercy then upon us, preaching and hearing this day. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have you ever stopped to wonder just what a privilege you have as a Christian who is living after the day of Pentecost? I know that sometimes we, we look at these disciples and we say, what's wrong with these men? How is it that they don't understand? And I don't wish to excuse their ignorance, and I'm not trying to uh, push their sinfulness to one side. But to have the Holy Spirit opening your eyes so that you can behold the things that belong to God in Christ Jesus, so that you can uh, begin to see Christ in all the scriptures, is a wonder that I think we typically underestimate. It's one of the reasons why, as we read through these sections in Luke's Gospel, we're sometimes left saying, how is it that they don't see? Why is it that they don't get it? Christ is the one who sees clearly. Here is the man who is filled with the Holy Spirit. It has come upon him. The Holy Spirit has come upon him. He has descended in the form of a dove. John the Baptist saw the Holy Spirit coming down, and he did not leave Jesus Christ. And so Christ sees. Christ understands. The Lord Jesus gets it. And so often the disciples don't. And some of that is what lies behind these words that we're reading. On the one hand, in this section, we've got divine determination and delight. 
God is accomplishing his purposes to the praise of the glory of his grace. And on the other hand, you've got the distraction and the dullness of the disciples. The Lord Jesus, at that turning point between these two covenants, the Passover meal, the last one he'll celebrate, which now becomes the first Lord's Supper. This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is shed for you. And Judas goes out to betray him. And the disciples, having heard about the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, start arguing about who's the most important, who carries the most weight amongst them. And our Lord says, Simon, the devil wants to sift all of you like wheat, but I'm praying for you that you will not fail in your faith. And when you are restored to me, when you retrace your steps, you need to strengthen your brothers. And Peter doesn't say, oh Lord, keep me from such folly. What he says is, I'm going to be fine. Everything's going to be all right. I'll go with you wherever it takes, even to prison, even to death. I'm your man. And then he says to them, verse 35, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? And they said nothing. He said to them, but now he who has a money bag, let him take it and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, we've got two swords. And Jesus said, it is enough. My friends, you and I still need the spirit of God to understand that Christ's kingdom is not of this world. You and I still need the, kingdom, the spirit of God to understand that what they have done to the master they will do to the servant. We still need the Spirit of God to understand the pilgrim path that the Lord Jesus has marked out for us. Are we the soldiers of the cross, the followers of the Lamb? That's the question we just sang to one another. Remember what we've been saying in the Sunday school. We're not just mouthing words, we're not just enjoying tunes. You sang to one another. Are you a follower of the Lamb? Are you a soldier of the cross? And that's the question that we need to answer as we come to this passage today. It begins with a question about the past. When I sent you, did you lack anything? It continues with an instruction for the future. If you've got a money bag, take it. If you've got a knapsack, take it. If you haven't got a sword, sell your clothes and buy one. It goes on with a prophecy to be fulfilled, and that's what really explains what's taking place for them and for us. And then it concludes with a response which is rejected by Christ. Let's work through those things and draw what we can from them. A question about the past. Now remember our Lord said that Satan wants to sift all the disciples. Then he spoke particularly to Peter, who, as so often he was the mouth, is also now the ears for the disciples. <clears throat> and now he's speaking to all of them again. When I sent you without money bag, without knapsack and sandals, did you lack anything? And if you don't know Luke's gospel, or if you don't remember how far we've been through this gospel, you might be saying, should I remember? Do I remember? So you can turn back to Luke chapter 9 and you can turn back to Luke chapter 10. At the beginning of Luke chapter 9, the Lord Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs nor bag nor bread nor money and do not have two tunics each. Whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Or at the beginning of Luke chapter 10. 
After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. He said, the harvest is great. The laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. Go your way as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house, and again the distinction will be clear. So he now says to the twelve who are with him in the upper room, Do you remember that? Do you remember when I sent you out? And do you remember when I also sent the other seventy out? And when I told you, Don't take a money bag. Don't take a knapsack or a backpack, we might say, or a satchel. Don't take extra sandals. Did you need anything when I told you to do that? Did you lack anything? And they think about it and they go, no, nothing. No, we were, we were perfectly fine. Everything we needed was provided for us. Now, it clearly wasn't all plain sailing because where they went into some houses, they rejected the peace that they came preaching. When they went into some of those properties, they were rejected by the place where they were and they shook the dust off their feet in judgment against them. But generally speaking, it was a blessed season. The Lord Jesus sent them out with that power that revealed something of messianic reality. Christ had come to his people and they were healing the sick and they were casting out demons. And we've said that where Christ and his disciples went for that brief period, it must have felt like heaven on earth. There's, there's no sicknesses left where Jesus comes. There's no spiritual darkness left where the Lord Jesus and his disciples come. This is wonderful. And in measure, Israel as a nation was enjoying the arrival of Messiah. And those men were traveling in his name. They went in faith. They went under the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And they saw the darkness pressed back. And they saw God providing for them. They would go into a home and say, I have come from Jesus who is the Christ. And if there was any faith in that home, people would say, wonderful. Stay with us. Have a bed. Have a meal. Use us as your base of operations. And so, while there was spiritual combat, it was generally a positive experience and it was marked by provision that was made and progress that was enjoyed. And Jesus says, do you remember those days? Yes. Yeah, we remember, say the disciples. Did you lack anything? No, nothing. But now. But now. Something has changed. There's an instruction for the future, and the scene has shifted. There is a radical change that is now arriving in their experience and expectation. He who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Beforehand, you didn't need a money bag. Now, if you've got a bag with money, make sure you take it with you. Before, you didn't need a, a satchel, a knapsack, a, a backpack, whatever your carrying vessel is. But now you need to take it with you. And if you haven't got a sword, get a sword. And if that means selling your outer garment, then get the sword at the expense of the outer garment. Now, that's serious stuff. If I said to you today, as you were making your way to church at the hour that most of us came, there's something that is more important than your coat and umbrella this morning. Most of you would say, well, that's going to have to be pretty important. Have you seen the weather out there? If you're telling me that I must bring something, even if it means giving up my coat and umbrella, then you're talking about something that's fairly serious. And Jesus says, yes, we're talking about something that's serious. You've got money in a bag, make sure you carry it. You have a pack with provisions, make sure you take it. You have an outer garment, sell it and buy a sword instead. What's the imagery here? What's he trying to tell the disciples? He's saying this in essence. Men, you are now on a war footing. The circumstances have changed and you need to go equipped and encouraged in order to carry the fight. 
There is a new spiritual reality that is dawning. And you are going to go into a hostile environment in a way that you have not known before. It's perhaps an echo of some of what he said in chapter 12 and verse 49 and following. I came to send fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with how distressed I am until it is accomplished. Do you suppose that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you not at all, but rather division. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, two against three, father against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. There are times coming when in the light of that baptism of mine, because of my name, that the most precious and close of earthly relationships are going to be sundered through Jesus Christ. You then, he says to his disciples, that's your future reality. You're going to go into perilous places. You're going to go into fierce opposition. Now, some people read this and say, right, so Christians are like modern religious freedom fighters, yeah? We're like some kind of spiritual terrorists. We need to to take a sword. We need to conquer the world for Jesus Christ. We need to get aggressive. We we need to uh, establish a, a good base of operations. It's this kind of language that lay behind things like the Crusades of the Middle Middle Ages. What is Jesus going to say before this chapter's even finished when Peter gets out a sword in the garden and hits one of the servants of the high priest with it and cuts off his ear? Put up your sword. Permit even this. And that's the first reminder that we need to be very careful about how we interpret this. Now, Jesus says, take a sword. There are some people who like to think that he's saying, well, take a knife. You might need to make some sandwiches on the road. I don't think that's what he's saying. Besides, if he does, he also says, let him who lives by the knife die by the knife, which doesn't make any sense at all. This, this means a sword, okay? And the language is vivid. You're on a war footing. You need the money that you've got. You need the bag with your stuff. And you're going to go out into dangerous times and places. It doesn't mean... That if we go out evangelizing, if, I, if I'm going to go and knock on doors this week, okay, I'm going to need my wallet, I'm going to need my, my bag, and I'm going to need a pen knife. As is, if we think like that, we're, we're, we're doing exactly the same thing that the disciples are about to do. It's the Lord Jesus telling his disciples, you once went out with plenty in a time of relative peace. And now you're going out into a time of darkness and strife. And you need to be ready. And you need to understand that the rules have changed in that sense. You're about to walk a new road. And you need to be prepared for it. What I will say is that Jesus isn't saying, you're on your own now. He's not saying, I provided for you once, but now you need to take care of yourselves. Notice what he's doing. I want you to be ready. So I'm telling you, now, make sure you take your money back. Make sure you prepare your backpack. Make sure you get your sword. The instructions that the Lord Jesus leaves these men are just as careful, just as thoughtful, and just as loving in preparing them for what lies ahead as he was when he said, go without the money bag, go without the knapsack, go without the sandals because I'll take care of you then. This is Jesus taking care of his servants. This is the master providing for the disciples. If you follow his commands, you will still lack nothing. But why? And this is what carries us to the heart of the problem. What is changing? What has shifted so radically that before Jesus could say, go with nothing and you'll be fine, and now he says, go as if you're going to fight a war and carry everything with you. What's the shift? The answer's in verse 37. For I say to you, here's the reason. 
This is the answer. I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me, and he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. Here is Christ seeing things clearly. Here is the man who is filled with the Holy Spirit, who understands what is taking place in his experience and in theirs. The answer to this problem of this shift in circumstance and setting lies in this expression of profound self-awareness and reflection on the part of our Lord Jesus Christ. He understands where he is in the passage of what we might call redemptive history. He's the one who understands that he is about to lay down his life for the disciples. He's the one who appreciates that in the Lord's Supper there are these emblems now of his body and his blood which are given in sacrifice for his people. He understands that the new covenant in his blood is about to come in. He knows that it needs to be accomplished what was written by Isaiah the prophet in what we call chapter 53 and verse 12, that the servant of God must be numbered with the transgressors. His course is run, and all is coming to its appointed conclusion. The Lord Jesus can see the purposes of God coming to their proper end. All the threads of prophecy are meeting in one person at one point. There's a step left to take before the things concerning him come to their conclusion, have their end. When he suffers with the transgressors for the transgressors. To what does he refer? In a few hours, this Jesus is going to hang dying on a cross, suspended at eye level before the mockery and scorn, the spitting and the buffeting of those who hate him. And on his hand on each side, there is going to be a thief, an evildoer, a brutal robber. And Christ is going to be treated like them numbered with the transgressors on that level alone staggering but numbered with the transgressors in the sense even more profoundly of suffering and dying for the sake of sinners like me and you Christ understands that he is at the point of making himself a sacrifice for our sins taking to himself all the weight, all the horror, all the awfulness of the transgressions of his people and accursed in the eyes of God, the wrath of the Almighty in all his holiness is going to be poured out on a sinless man who is being counted as the worst and chief of sinners. Jesus Christ says, that's coming next. The cross is the next and final step in the accomplishment of salvation. And that is going to change everything. Now, how do you think of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, even if you're not actually a Christian here this morning, the fact that you're here and not throwing things at me or storming out in a fury suggests at least that you think Jesus is kind of okay. Nice enough? Good enough? That you're willing to do a little bit of religion? Most of us have lived for most of our lives in societies where the idea that Christianity is generally a kind of a good thing is the norm. Where the Lord Jesus is typically thought to be a a good man, a nice man, maybe slightly misguided, but generally speaking, a pretty decent fellow. Religion is nice, Christianity is a nice thing, Jesus is a nice person, and we're all just going to jolly along together. For the first two or three hundred years after the death of Jesus Christ, Jesus was hated and despised. No one thought of Jesus as a good man. 
they thought of him as a wretched, vile criminal. His name was hated. His name was despised. They killed people who esteemed him. He was no benefactor, no doer of good, but a malefactor, a doer of evil. Those who followed the false gods hated him and his followers because he was a new god in their estimation who was drawing people away. Do you know in the first centuries when they talked about atheists, do you know who they were talking about? Christians. The people who didn't believe in the gods but have this Jesus of Nazareth whom they follow. And people like Saul of Tarsus who because he was a Jew of the Jews, hunted the followers of this Nazarene even to the point of death. To the Jews, the idea of a crucified Jesus was offensive to the very depths of their being. That we should need a man who dies on a cross to make us right with God. My, what kind of people are you? And to the Gentiles, the Greeks, the wise people of their day, How offensive to our intellectual understanding, to our profound grasp of of metaphysical truths to think that we need a man who is also God, who dies on a cross nailed to a tree, that we should know true wisdom? We're accustomed to Jesus being, at least in measure, honoured and appreciated and for the church in measure to be tolerated and accepted. And Jesus says to his disciples, you're going to go into a world where they hate me and they'll hate you for my sake. You're going to go not just now to the tribes of Israel, not just around Judea, not just around Jerusalem, but to Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. You're going to go to Jews for whom a man dying on a cross is a sign of God's wrath and curse. You're going to go to Gentiles for whom the idea of the word become flesh and dying to make us right with God is a vile nonsense. They're not going to open their homes to you. They're not going to put on a meal for you. They're not going to say, come and stay with us until your work here is done. You read some of the travels of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. You understand why he needs a money bag? Why he needs a satchel? Why he needs a sword? What does he ask Timothy to bring him when he's in prison? I'd like an outer garment, please. I haven't even got one of those. Why? Because up to this point, it's still possible to think that Jesus is okay and these healings and these teachings and these blessings, that's nice enough. But when he dies on the cross, everything changes. For him and for his disciples. What does the Apostle Paul say in Galatians chapter 6? You are now living as those who are crucified to the world and the world is crucified to you. From now on, when you look out there, you see the world as a whole under the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. You can only look at things through that lens because you're followers of the crucified one. And you know how the world looks at you? Back through the same lens. You're the followers of the crucified man. You need to be on a war footing, says Jesus, because this is your reality. Now hear me carefully, brothers and sisters. I think it's going to be ours too before long. The ease that we have mostly enjoyed in our society, the respect that is afforded to Christianity, the so-called Judeo-Christian heritage, the social and the moral benefits that we have enjoyed because of the blessings that God has given in this and other parts of the world through making his word known and granting that it may have a powerful effect are being eroded by the day. 
you're going to need your money bag. You're going to need your backpack. You're going to need to sell your outer garment and buy a sword. Because this is the world in which you and I are now living. One that lies under the shadow of the cross of Jesus Christ. And I would be no faithful shepherd to you if I said, you know what, the world's going to love you. Christianity is going to be easy. And everywhere you go, people will take care of you. Now, that's true in measure. Why? Because when this strange Englishman parachutes into Singapore, Brit, Brit I should say, Welshman, Italian, whatever, the mix, when this mongrel man, <laughs> when this mongrel man arrives in Singapore, I get treated like I'm a part of the family. When, God willing, I go across to America later next year, or when I arrive in Zambia, they'll treat me just like I'm part of the family. Why? Because we're all followers of the cross. But to go outside of the people of God, that is to be exposed to hatred, scorn, malice, and disdain. And my friend, if you don't yet understand that as a Christian, then it's because you found a way to cover up and pretend to people that you're not really a true believer. If you have at all begun to live with any kind of honesty and integrity and transparency as a child of God, you have begun to taste and to feel the antagonism of a fallen world. Maybe it's a little subtle. Maybe it's just a little name-calling, a little sneer, a little disdain, a little distance. But it is there and it is increasing. And the more this world and this society and this culture turns its back upon God, the harder, the more difficult, the more painful it is going to be for God's people to live as God's people in the world. And now, that's the world that we live in. And the disciples said, Oh, Lord, look, we've got two swords. This is that moment. Again? Really? We've been here before, haven't we? Do you remember when the Lord Jesus was with the disciples and he was on the Sea of Galilee and they were going across and he said, Now beware of the leaven of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the disciples, they're going, Because we haven't got any bread, you idiot. Why didn't you bring the bread? The Lord Jesus, I'm not talking about bread, bread. I'm talking about the spiritual influence of the scribes and the Pharisees, the leaven, the spiritual yeast, if you like, that spreads so dangerously and, and works its way through your whole experience and environment. And that seems to be what's going on here. Look, Lord, we've got two swords. Remember... They don't see yet. You and I should. But they don't. They hear only half of what Jesus has, says, has said. And they're looking with the world's eyes still. And so they bring what is essentially a, a worldly interpretation. I'm not saying they don't believe that Jesus is the Christ. I'm saying they don't understand. It's well-meaning, but it is misguided. It is entirely sincere, and it is still wrong. It may be that they're in the house there, in that upper room. And when the Lord Jesus says, if you've got an outer garment, sell it and go and get a sword, that one says, oh, I saw some swords downstairs. And, and then one of them runs back upstairs and says, Lord, we've got two swords. It may even be that this is where Simon, Peter, got the sword that he was then to use in the garden. Right. He said, I'm going to betray him. He said, I'm going to deny him three times. But he said, I was going to need a sword. Yeah, he's, misunder he's underestimated this, this Peter fella. I've got my sword ready. I'm going to follow you, even to prison and to death. See, the disciples are arming for physical combat. And they say, we're nearly ready. Two amongst twelve. Is that a good start? Christ is preparing for the cross. He says, I'm nearly there. And you need to be ready for what happens afterward. 
Your heart should be breaking for the Lord Jesus at this point. The same sort of thing's going to happen in a few moments when he goes into the garden and the disciples, most of them stay outside, but three go with him and he says, will you watch and pray with me? And they can't. They all fall asleep. Here is the isolation of the Lord Jesus. He has the cross now filling his gaze when he is going to lay down his life for sinners like me and you. And the disciples are arguing about who's the most important. And when he says you need to be ready to go out as soldiers of the cross and as followers of the Lamb, they say, we found a couple of swords downstairs, Lord. Is this going to do the job? And the Lord Jesus doesn't say, you've got enough swords. I think he says, this is enough. End of conversation. Ever been in that situation? You're talking at cross purposes. Someone's trying to explain something to you and you just don't get it. And someone's like, yeah, enough. Enough of this. They're not getting anywhere here. Time to draw a line. Let's move on. There's no point discussing this any further. My friends, I am left asking how often the risen Jesus might look upon the church of today with its schemes and strategies for the advance of the kingdom of God and here are still saying, in effect, I found two swords. Maybe this will be enough. I've got a new strategy. I've got a worldly scheme. We need more power. We need more glory as the world thinks of it. We need more people. We need more money. We need a better presentation. We can make this work for us. And I hear Christ speaking in an echo from heaven. Enough of this. Enough of this. The people of God need to understand where we stand in the history of the world and where we stand in relation to our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are soldiers of the cross. We are followers of the Lamb and we live on this side of the crucifixion. We live on this side of the resurrection. We live on this side of the ascension. And our Saviour has said, get ready for what comes next. And he has told us, as he will tell them, behold, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. And as you go out into a hostile world, and as you declare a crucified Jesus, men will hate you, men will despise you, men will reject you. But where I am at work by my mighty spirit... I will humble the proud. I will break down those who are lifted up. I will empty those who think they are full. I will show them my glory and they shall come to know me and trust me. Brothers and sisters, if you and I want to be of earthly use, we need to get heavenly minded. We need to stop thinking in terms of our swords and our money and whatever else it may be. And we need to remember that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not worldly. They're not earthly. We don't go to war with tanks and bombs and guns and planes. We go marching as followers of the Lamb, soldiers of the cross. Our weapon is the gospel, which is mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. And we need to understand that there will be opposition and antagonism to a crucified Jesus in this fallen world. And we need to go faithful. What did Peter boast? I'm ready to go with you, Lord, even to prison and to death. What did Jesus say to his restored disciple? John 21. You're going to go. You won't go by yourself. You won't be able to prepare yourself physically then, Peter. They will take you. They will carry you. And you will go to prison. And you will go to death. And by these, you will glorify me. Because you will not go boasting. But you will go in humble faith, having learned that you are a soldier of the cross and a follower of of the Lamb. My friends, Christians typically have this to look forward to in this world prison and death. We're not used to that. We've got out of the habit 
of understanding it, expecting it, preparing for it, and glorifying God in the midst of it. This is spiritual reality. We need to be ready for a fight, a spiritual combat in which our weapons are those that God has given us. Our confidence is in a Christ who has died, but who has risen again from the dead, who has poured out his spirit in our hearts and who will keep us and bless us and go with us as we make our way through this world. Was the master hated? So will the servants be. Was his cross the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek? Was this cross the power of God and the wisdom of God to the Jew and also to the Gentile? Then it is our message still. It is our confidence still. It is our hope still that we as disciples will take up our cross and we will follow him. Don't go looking for a sword. It's not what he means. Don't imagine that you can get enough in this world to make the church somehow powerful and acceptable and uh, effective. We are followers of a crucified saviour. And that is our boast, our hope and our joy.